Welcome to Mercy Hospital in Miami, Florida. Over the next hour, you'll see an electrophysiological study and catheter ablation with 3D mapping. During the procedure, doctors look at the electrical system of the heart by recording the electrical activity from within the chambers of the heart. Thin catheters are advanced into the heart through a small tube to see if the irregular heartbeat can be reproduced. Doctors can then perform the ablation in which radio frequency energy is delivered through a catheter that is in contact with the abnormal pathway or focus. OR Live makes it easy for you to learn more. Just click on the request information button on your webcast screen and open the door to informed medical care. Now, let's join the doctors. Good evening and welcome to Mercy Hospital. I'm Dr. Peter Garcia. You'll be joining us for a live webcam where we perform a uh, electrophysiology study with ablation using our 3D mapping system. Um, keep in mind that during the procedure if you have any questions please click on your screen and we'll be able to answer your questions live during the procedure. Um, this procedure is performed to treat patients with cardiac arrhythmias and we'll give you a, a live up-close view on how this is performed. Now come along with me and we're gonna introduce you to Dr. Alan Tyrion Jr. who'll be performing the procedure. No, 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 uh, This is Dr. Alan Tyrion Jr. He's going to be performing the procedure to, this evening while you join us. He's actually one of the pioneers in this uh, procedure. He's developed many of the techniques and many of the uh, technology used to perform these procedures. Dr. Tyrion? Uh, thank you, Peter. And I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, Mercy Hospital's Arrhythmia Syncope Center. Um, today we're going to be doing an, an ablation for atrial flutter. Um, atrial flutter and fibrillation are arrhythmias that afflict primarily the elder patient. Uh, they uh, can be sort of life-threatening. Uh, they tend to lead to clot formation and stroke. Uh, this patient who's 78 years old has a history of hypertension, uh, diabetes, and some other ailments, including an increased cholesterol first presented with, in the past, with six sinus syndrome. In other words, his natural pacemaker was not working well. So he had a DDD pacemaker placed. Then most recently, he had a TIA, so a, a minor little stroke. At that time, an EKG was found, it was done, and he was found to be in this atrial flutter, atrial fibrillation, primarily atrial flutter. A uh, transesophageal echo done at that time revealed that he had a small clot in his left atrial appendage. The, at that time, it was put on blood thinners with the hope of resolving the clot. Uh, this was done approximately six weeks ago. Now he's being brought, he had a, a transesophageal echo done by Dr. Garcia, which showed organization of the clot and almost total resolution. We are now gonna try to restore him back to his normal rhythm, get him out of this arrhythmia, hopefully, uh, and really, if everything goes well, in another six weeks, he has a potential of being able to come off blood thinners. So we'll go ahead and get started. Peter, mm -hmm. anything you want to comment on? Yes, um, maybe you could tell the viewers um, what the benefits of uh, ablation is for this type of arrhythmia as opposed to medical therapy. Sure, that's a very good question. You know, medical therapy really doesn't cure you. Uh, it does just controls the arrhythmia, and the patient's really at risk of having this arrhythmia recur at any time. As I stated in the past, blood clots can be formed from this arrhythmia, so unless you're chronically anticoagulated, uh, the risk is still there. I'm in a process of putting catheters up into the heart. We have put sheaths in both the right and left growing. Um, we're, using fluoroscopic guidance, we're going to guide these sheaths up into the heart. And you can see that in this case we have a catheter with 10 platinum electrodes in it. Uh, Cindy, you want to hook up the, uh, the catheter? And this is going to use to map. We're also going to use this to create a, uh, a three-dimensional hologram type picture with the three-dimensional mapping tool. You'll be able to see this. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna start doing this right now. We're basically right now in 
the right atrium. Mm -hmm. We're going mm -hmm. up into the Superior Vena Cava, oh, which is yeah, one of the major forward. vessels that feeds the, the, uh, the heart. Okay, uh, have you collected these points? I'm in the SVC right now. Okay, I'm, I'm going to be coming off the SVC into the right atrium. Okay. Now, now one of the important points here to notice is, is that we also do these procedures with just conscious sedation. General anesthesia is not needed or used, and we use the local anesthetic in the groin. So the recovery time is, is very quick. Um, often these patients can go home the same day of their procedure. Now, as you can see, Dr. Interior is manipulating the, the larger catheter to the left of the screen in the right atrium, and that's going to give us electrical activation in the right side of the heart. You can see on the right side of the screen, there's another catheter with four electrodes on it, and that's giving us electrical activation through the left side of the heart or the left atrium. These catheters help us uh, distinguish the type of arrhythmia the patient has. And okay, also helps us uh, perform the ablation procedure. And I'm trying to create the shell by collecting the points. And you can see in the, in the uh, three-dimensional ESI screen, you can see the creation of the sheath. What is wrong with him? OK, is he sli asleep? OK, fine. Hold off on the verset, OK? Now you can see in this patient, as he has a pacemaker wires already in the heart, uh, we're very careful not to to. This is uh, the uh, tricuspid aneurysms. More of the tricuspid annulus. More, more, more. I'm just ro rolling over at the tricuspid valve. That's the ventricle right there. Uh, this is the base of the right atrium. I think. I, mm -hmm. Okay, now I'm in the inferior vena cava, which is the other main uh, vessel that feeds the uh, the the heart. Okay. How's how's that diagram going? Huh? Any areas you want me to uh, pick up? Again, I'm in the ventricle right now. I'm on a, this is the coronary sinus right there, if you see it. Hey, reverse the verse man. Now the coronary sinus, you can't visually see the coronary sinus, but if you look to the right of the screen, the, the catheter extending all the way to the right is within the coronary sinus. The coronary sinus is actually a little vein that runs behind the left atrium and the left side of the heart. And the electrical circuit that causes this arrhythmia originates in the right side of the heart. And the electrical activation, after originating in the right side of the heart, then travels to the left side of the heart. Now, once the, the 3D map is made of the atrium where the arrhythmia is located, um, we can proceed with the ablation procedure. And that can be done without fluoroscopy or without x-ray exposure to the patient. And also, when the, the ablation is started, um, we're delivering little burns to the muscle of the heart to terminate the arrhythmia and uh, get rid of the circuit of the arrhythmia. Sorry. And we can locate and go back to those areas very spe specifically and precisely using the mapping system. Now, as the patient is only eh? receiving conscious sedation, you may hear during the Madonna. procedure that he wakes up a little bit eh? um, because he's receiving so-called twilight uh, oh. sedation. But he's... Uh, otherwise comfortable throughout the procedure and we avoid the risks of general anesthesia by performing the procedure in this fashion. I'm putting a, another catheter up and this is going to go into the uh, into the, the his area. I, I like using this catheter. It's a catheter I designed years ago um, for the for uh, taking the the uh, his image. It's got a little, little longer area at the tip and the electrodes are a little bit behind it. I think it works pretty good for getting his electrograms. Right. 
Now the, the his catheter that's being placed is also being placed in the right side of the heart against the septum, so a different area in the right side of the heart. And, and again, the electrical activation in the heart during the arrhythmia uh, allows us to distinguish this type of arrhythmia from other types of arrhythmias. Okay. Uh, Afulabi, can you go ahead and pace and see if you can entrain the, uh, the arrhythmia, please? The flutter, which is what it looks like. Now, besides looking at the electrical activation, when we pace from certain areas of the heart, we actually capture the electrical circuit to confirm again that the arrhythmia we're dealing with is atrial flutter. You know, right now, I'm, I'm, I've placed all the catheter that I need for, for the diagnostic part. Uh, I have one in the coronary sinus, one, one near the his area. And uh, what I've asked one of my associates is that uh, you have a hiss there, Ernie. Can you grab that hiss? You see it? Did you see it? Okay, measure the HV, please. You have a nice HV there. Um, and I want to entrain it. So we're going to pace from the coronary sinus because it, looking at, um, at the surface ECG, we can look at the EKG screen. We, okay. by the, the way look the activation is going, the left to the mapping, um, it looks like it's counterclockwise flutter. Mm -hmm. we, place that oh. decapolar catheter up there and, and, and a his catheter and it, seeing the, the sequence of activation it looks like counterclockwise flutter which uses the area near the coronary sinus where that first catheter was placed as part of the circuit so we're going to try to pace from there and see if we can capture mm -hmm. that circuit if we capture that circuit mm -hmm. it means we're in the right area and sure. that's where we're going to go and burn and hopefully cure this gentleman of this uh, bothersome arrhythmia and potentially life-threatening if we think about stroke. Okay. If you look quickly uh, at the, uh, the uh, EKG there, you can see the electrical potentials from the catheters within the heart, which uh, Dr. Interian was uh, describing. And on that screen you see that the real-time electrical activation of the heart during the arrhythmia. Now we correlate this with the 3D mapping images Ernie, put my mapping catheter up. To help confirm the, the type of arrhythmia this patient Oye. has. No me mueva la pierna más. No mueva la pierna más. Now, if you look at that yellow line, hook me up there, Cindy, and let's get the flush going. EKG. Mm -hmm. Okay. Huh? Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Scott? Let's flush it. Let's flush it. Now, right. the, the yellow line on the screen is going to show the electrical activation from the ablation catheter. That's the actual catheter that delivers the, the radio frequency energy to cause the burns in the heart that get rid of the electrical okay. circuit causing this arrhythmia. And when, uh, when Dr. Interian positions that catheter uh, within the uh, area of the circuit okay. of this arrhythmia, okay will note electrical Flush potential again, specific oh, for, for this arrhythmia. So what we're doing right now, we're using a saline irrigated catheter. Uh, this catheter, the tip here that we're seeing, heats up. But Scott, can you flush the please so I can see? And, and water comes out of it. Let's go, Scott. You see the water coming out of it, dripping there? You see it? Right there? You see it? Yeah, you see it? It's like a little shower. You see it? Well, what, the, what happens, it, 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 this cools the interface of the tissue and the tip that we're heating up. Atrial flutter, uh, the areas you have to cauterize or ablate can be very deep and by using this saline irrigate allows us to burn longer so no charring occurs at the tip and also lets us penetrate below the surface to get a deeper burn. So that's why we picked this saline irrigated catheter to do this procedure. Okay. If we go to the fluoro image, we can now watch uh, the catheter being advanced through the, through the vena cava up into the heart. And then under fluoroscopy on the x-ray image, um, the catheter is going to be positioned in the area of the atrial flutter circuit, which is in the base of the, the right atrium. Now once the catheter is in the heart, that catheter will appear also on the 3D image and we can look over to the uh, three-dimensional image now. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And shortly we'll see the, uh, once we get our connections squared away here, you'll be able to see the ablation catheter on the 3D image. Hey Ernie, I don't have a signal on my ablation. Ernie, I don't have a signal on my ablation catheter. You're not connected to Cindy, will they connect you? Now again, through through much of the remainder of the oh, ablation right. okay. of the remainder of the ablation procedure, we don't have to use X-ray once we located that that catheter on the screen. Okay, we're okay. okay. Yeah, now we are. Now the tail wasn't properly connected. All right. You can see that the yellow. Uh, have Have you uh, optimized yet? With ESI, okay. please. Now we're locating the ablation catheter with the 3D image. You can see it there, it's the white catheter on the 3D image with the green tip. And once we get everything calibrated, um, Dr. Interior will start moving that catheter into the area of the, the atrial flutter circuit. Now the, the technology for these catheters that have, has advanced uh, tremendously over the last few years. Initially the ablations used to be performed by shock ablations, where actually electrical shocks were delivered through the catheter to cause the, the damage to the circuit to, to cure the, these arrhythmias. Now we use this uh, very uh, specialized catheters that really allow us to focus on a specific area without uh, damage to other areas of the heart during the procedure. Okay. Now looking at the, at the 3D map, you'll see an image to the left of the screen and one to the right. And these are different uh, orientations of the heart. One with the heart um, facing us a little bit to the right and one looking from below the heart um, and from the left side. And we're looking at two, basically two uh, dimensions on the screen. But these images we can actually rotate in whatever degree or, or uh, dimension we want to look at the catheters from other views. But these are the standard views we look at. Now the, the ablation catheter is being positioned near the tricuspid valve um, and on the atrial side of the tricuspid valve that's where the uh, circuit originates. And Dr. Interior now is delivering the radio frequency pulses that will create the, the cautery burns that will eventually uh, terminate this arrhythmia and, and get rid of the electrical circuit. And as he creates uh, one of these burns in the heart, we'll be marking the points with a different colored dot. And that way we know which areas we've uh, performed the ablation in. Again, we're just calibrating the, the equipment here. You're doing the same thing over again. That's not going to do it. Okay. okay. While we're waiting to set up, we'll take uh, we'll take a few questions um, that have come across the uh, the internet live. One of them is, will this ablation procedure work for atrial fibrillation? And this ablation procedure can also be used for atrial fibrillation, um, mainly uh, best uh, served for what's called focal atrial fibrillation, atrial fibrillation that originates from the left side of the heart around the pulmonary veins. Hey, Scott, let's make it fast. And yeah, although the procedure is a little more technically complicated um, for atrial fibrillation, it can also be performed to cure um, atrial fibrillation in, uh, in many patients. Atrial fibrillation is similar to atrial flutter. It's more, however, more of a disorganized arrhythmia and originates from the left side of the atrium, the left atrium, as opposed to the atrial flutter circuit, which originates from the right side of the heart. Okay, I have another another question from the uh, the internet while we're waiting to tr to set up our connections there. The next question is uh, from a patient who periodically goes into atrial fibrillation 
who's been cardioverted in the past and currently on Rhythmol. And uh, the question is whether the atrial fibrillation ablation would benefit this patient from atrial fibrillation. Now, again, mo the patients that most benefit from ablation of atrial fibrillation are patients with lo what's called lone atrial fibrillation. They don't have other structural heart disease. They, in general, don't have enlarged hearts or leaky valves. And those patients who have failed antiarrhythmic therapy and have frequent symptoms are patients that uh, would be, in general, good candidates for ablation from the atrial fibrillation. In general, for atrial flood or the arrhythmia we're treating today, we can cr uh, cure this roughly 90% of the time. Um, atrial fibrillation, the cure rate right now is not as high, probably about 70% or so, and it's a more aggressive procedure. As technology advances, though, I suspect the, uh, the cure rate for atrial fibrillation from ablation uh, with ablation will be much higher. Okay, uh, you know, we got all our bugs worked out and uh, we got everything calibrated and everything else. And I'm trying to lo uh, localize the area where I want to burn, and that's what I'm doing right now. And, um, fluoro image. Let, let's look at the fluoro image now, and you can see the catheter for the ablation to the right side of the screen pointing down. And, uh, and what Dr. Interion did was correlate the 3D mapping image with the fluoroscopy image. And now that he started the ablation procedure, we can look at the 3D image. And you'll see the, uh, the view on the left of the 3D image screen. If we can uh, move over there. You can see that little red dot next to the tip of the white catheter with the green tip. And that's the first ablation point that's been made. What uh, Dr. Interion is going to do is he's going to create a, a linear burn, a little line from the tricuspid valve back to the IVC to get rid of this atrial flutter circuit. The atrial flutter circuit is actually a, a loop, uh, makes an electrical loop through the right atrium. And we're going to take out part of that loop with the, uh, with the ablation procedure. Peter, what we're actually doing, you know, we have an electrical circuit and we're going to be throwing a little barrier in there by our burn. So we're going to create a little barrier by burning right across that, that small area where the uh, flutter occurs and then interrupt the circuit. And so it's basically like taking a pair of pliers and cutting an electrical wire. Once you cut it, the electricity can't go across and you can't have that short circuit. And I'm going to be dragging this catheter and you will see more red dots, red dots. I'll, I'll burn for about 40, 45 mm -hmm. seconds and then move back slowly um, until hopefully we'll create a successful line. N N Is he okay? Yeah. Huh? Now huh? I'm sure some of the viewers would be interested to know does the, if the patient's feeling anything at this point or how much discomfort do they, do they have during the procedure? I think, you know, it's an individual thing. I think uh, some patients have a little more discomfort, others less. Um, it, you know, particularly with the saline irrigated, it doesn't let the temperature, um, the charring on it goes, it's a little less discomfort, but certainly they may feel, feel a little burning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Huh. Now, um, without the saline tip catheter, sometimes we, we uh, achieve temperatures up to 70 degrees Celsius, but right here from our monitors we're about 38 to 40 degrees Celsius. So again, as uh, Dr. Interion mentioned, this prevents uh, char formation and less discomfort uh, in general to the patient during the procedure. As you can see again on the 3D images, um, we've now, there have been several points that have um, received radio frequency ablation uh, energy there. You can see them by the red points. And what we're going to do is uh, again create that linear lesion back to the, uh, to the inferior vena cava to get rid of this arrhythmia. We try to make our patients as comfortable as possible. But at that same time, we don't like to put them down to a point where they require intubation and, 
and can't breathe on their own. So we try to make them comfortable with, with sedation, but uh, we like to be able to communicate with them as we need to. Now, if you want to pan over to the EKG images, um, here on the EKG images, you can see in the blue colors at the, at the top of the EKG images, that's the electrical activation in the atrium of the heart. The patient's atrium is beating approximately 300 beats per minute. And once we um, completely burn the, the circuit that causes this arrhythmia, you'll see that the frequency of the atrial um, electrical activation decrease uh, significantly. So most of the time during the procedure, we'll see a termination of the arrhythmia as we deliver the, the ablation energy. Okay, if we want to look back to the 3D images again, you can see a few more uh, radio frequency uh, burns have been delivered there. And now if we go to the, to the fluoroscopy images, the X-ray images, you can see on the X-ray image the, ca the ablation catheter with the thick tip at the bottom of the heart is actually moving back towards the left side of the screen. So it's moving across the uh, base of the right atrium by our X-ray image. Before these 3D um, mapping systems were used, we would have to use um, fluoroscopy throughout the procedure. So the patients would receive considerably more radiation from the X-ray uh, images, which we would have to, we'd have to continuously monitor. That's, uh, as we mentioned, one of the major benefits of using these three-dimensional uh, computerized systems less, uh, less ra radiology, radiologic exposure to the patient. And one more thing, Peter, the other thing that helps us is it tells us where we've burned and where we've been. So, we, you know, we can see the dots where they're at. If we need to fill in the gaps in between, uh, it's also very helpful in that sense. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Some, some patients have very thickened heart muscle, and we have to do more than one burn in the same area. And uh, the 3D mapping image, as you can see, allows us to go right back to those red points and, and deliver further burns to get rid of the, uh, the atrial uh, tissue in those areas in thickened hearts. Now, uh, Al, why don't we uh, give them a rough idea how long the procedures take in general and how that's, uh, how that's uh, evolved over, over time with the new technology? Well, you know, I think you know, in the past we used to do these uh, ablations with normal uh, catheters, and, um, um, and that took a little longer because uh, we didn't have the penetration capability that we have with these saline irrigated catheters. So it did take longer, as you know. Um, now with these saline irrigated catheters, they take a little longer. Uh, you know, it, the, the technology has developed tremendously. It originally um, started with uh, I, the catheters being an extension of a cautery unit that is a surgical uh, piece that is used in the OR. And when we used to connect a handmade catheter to these cautery units and, and basically cauterize and uh, in a sense, uh, through the catheter. Um, then, you know, things got more sophisticated and we found that, and actually when I first started doing this, the first case I did, it was using a, an old Valley Lab cautery unit. This was probably over 20 years ago um, with an inline ohm meter from Radio Shack that we used to use to me measure the impedance or the inverse of the resistance. Uh, and that if the, the resistance or impedance went up, then we knew we had charring at the tip. Um, catheters were handmade, um, and we used them multiple times. And we really only had one catheter. And as things became more sophisticated, they put temperature sensors at the tip. Two types have been developed, thermistor and thermocouple. Um, so they, they actually had, 
have a sensing loop which adjusts the energy or the actual that is being given to the tip to maintain a temperature that is not um, higher than 70 degrees centigrade or Celsius. And the reason they, they use that is because above 70 degrees you get boiling and more charring is used. So 70 has been found to be the ideal temperature between 60 and 70 uh, degrees Celsius has been found to be the ideal temperature uh, to deliver an effective lesion and, and not obtain charring or, or, or of the tissue at the tip. Now with these saline irrigated catheters all that went out of style because what happens is that they they uh, they really use the 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 water in the water coming in contact the saline in other words um, which is heparinized uh, come in contact with the the endocardium of the of that area between the tricuspid annulus and the inferior vena cava to heat to heat it up so no this technology allows you that that freedom of having no charring burning being able to burn longer and and, uh, and achieve penetration so so basically you know advances in the catheters advances in the ablation equipment um, have allowed us to take this procedure from being often uh, you know as as far not so far long far ago as five six years ago from being a four to five hour procedure to in general roughly an hour procedure hopefully we only got an hour so uh, <laughs> so hopefully that, that that's what I take but you're right I mean it really uh, allows us to shorten the procedure now, and yeah. you gotta remember the the healthier the heart uh, the more muscle is there the longer it takes because you have to be able to penetrate deeper and sicker patients with with thinner mu um, muscle 3D. Uh, the the it's it's it, it's easier now also important to note you know all these procedures we perform routinely the risk of complications dramatically decrease by shortening the time of the procedure and um, again a benefit for the patients less risk for the patients um, you can see on the 3d images now that uh, Dr. Interior is doing some more burns a little bit closer to the coronary sinus um, he's uh, the coronary sinus sometimes is, is intricately involved in atrial flutter and he's he's connecting that line of dots with the previous line of dots to uh, create a more uh, more definitive uh, uh, ablation lesion for this patient. Okay, for those of you who have just joined us, um, we're here at the uh, Mercy Arrhythmia Syncope Center performing uh, electrophysiology study and three-dimensional uh, mapping and ablation of atrial flutter. Um, Dr. Interian right now is performing the procedure to hopefully cure this patient of this, uh, of this arrhythmia. Um, again, uh, for those who have just joined us, we're using our three-dimensional mapping system which allows us to locate the electrical circuits causing this arrhythmia and create linear burns or, or ablation lesions to uh, permanently cure the, this arrhythmia. Any questions so far, Peter, from the audience? Um, we've had a couple on uh, atrial fibrillation, which I, I went over. Okay, good. And, um, but uh, if you want to let the patients know typically after the procedure what uh, type of restrictions and how, back the, how soon they can get back to work, back to their normal activities? Well, you, as, as you know, Peter, the, a lot of the restriction on these patients has to do with the puncture wounds in the groin. Most of these patients have to go back on blood thinners for at least four to six weeks uh, because of the uh, initial um, threat of clot formation that still exists when the, um, the ablation is first done. Mm -hmm. um, so th what, some of the problems that we have, and we've sort of been pretty good about doing that, 
is that um, these patients uh, tend to, uh, we tend to tell them to really take it easy for a few days. Mm -hmm. And then um, after three or four days, they can pretty much, if their growing is a little good, they don't have any hematomas or bruises in their growing, they might pretty much go up to normal activity. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times we perform this procedure as an outpatient uh, procedure. Patient comes in the same day, uh, comes in and, uh, and is discharged the same day. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the heart is really not the, the main problem here. As you can see, when uh, you were, we were looking over at the, the actual field of the procedure, you see the wires going in through the little uh, sheaths, the white sheaths in the groin. And those uh, tiny punctures we make to get the wires up into the heart really don't require any sutures. Um, with a little pressure after the procedure, those little puncture marks seal. So, so again, you know, the next day the patients can do limited walking and five days of no heavy bending or straining. If they are on an exercise program, probably a, a week or so before they start. But in general, again, the patients can often go home if they don't require um, anticoagulation with blood thinners uh, immediately after the procedure. And you can see there from the screen, uh, Dr. Interion is manipulating the catheter with his hands. Uh, the catheter on the, on the distal end of the catheter that's in his right hand actually has a little plunger. And when he moves that plunger, it uh, moves the catheter within the heart. And by, um, by fine manipulations of uh, the catheter, he can, he can move the catheter throughout the heart while watching the images, the 3D images, on the heart to know exactly where he's, he's moving that catheter. Um, there on the fluoro image again, you can see that ablation catheter to the bottom of the screen. It's now in the middle of the screen as he's moving it back across the atrium. And if we go up to the 3D image again, you can see that there's uh, more red little uh, spots where uh, ablation energy has been delivered. And again, you can see, as we mentioned, he's creating a, a little line of ablation points, um, uh, two little lines there. Um, and these lines are going to try to transect the electrical uh, circuit in the atrium of the heart. OK, and you can see as he's moving the catheter, again, for those who, of you who just joined us recently, the catheter that is actually delivering the energy is the uh, white catheter with the green tip. stubborn than usual, huh, Peter? Yeah, so, you know, this patient, as you can see from the fluoroscopy, his heart's uh, enlarged, so the actual lesion that you have to create is, is probably a little bit bigger yeah, than This than, is than a little wider, a little wider than more yeah. common. Well, you know, he's got hypertension, his muscle is thickened, mm -hmm. uh, the heart's a little bit enlarged, so, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's to be expected. Okay, well, we have a few more questions that come through the uh, through the uh, internet for us. One of them is how many days are required to stay in the hospital? I think we answered that one. From the ablation procedure itself, it's uh, really an outpatient procedure. So from the procedure itself, patients in general can go home the same day. The ones that we do keep in the hospital for a couple days are those who we re have to restart their blood thinners, the Coumadin. And um, the Coumadin actually takes a couple days, sometimes a little more, till it takes effect. So sometimes we have to put those patients in the hospital for intravenous uh, blood thinners. Now, I, I know, Al, you're interested in, uh, in preventive medicine. There's a question here. Um, what's the most effective type of preventive medicine uh, to prevent ar arrhythmias? Well, I think it, the answer is very clearly. Arrhythmias come most of the time secondary, unless they're congenital, uh, secondary to things that affect the heart. In this case, it was hypertension but uh, diabetes, heart attacks, et cetera. So the best preventive measure for acquired arrhythmias, which uh, accounts for the majority of them, is good heart health. And when I mean good heart health, I mean good uh, blood pressure control, eating right, controlling your cholesterol, uh, avoiding anything that's gonna damage your heart. Mm -hmm. 
Um, another question too uh, from one of the viewers is, uh, the question is, is the pacemaker actually causing this arrhythmia? No, absolutely not. Uh, the pacemaker's only wires are just getting in my way and making the procedure a little more tedious. But the pacemaker is used for a slow heart rate. Uh, and in this case, what he has is a very fast heart rate in the top part of his heart. Mm -hmm. yeah, and it's important to point out um, a lot of the patients with these uh, rapid arrhythmias or atrial arrhythmias also tend to get uh, slow heart rhythms when they're in normal rhythm. So this syndrome is called tachybrady syndrome, uh, rapid arrhythmias with the normal heart rate being slower than usual. And basically it's signs that the heart's own pacemaker function is kind of awry. And that's why often we see patients um, with atrial flood or atrial fibrillation requiring uh, pacemakers. Now that's a little different than, uh, than needing a pacemaker as a complication of the procedure. Um, there's another question if you want to take it out about what is the, the risk of, of heart block or requiring a pacemaker as a complication of the procedure? Uh, the, the, the incidence is very low um, because you're really burning away from the area where the, the main conduction system or the main electrical wiring of the heart is. But in patients like him that come in and flutter, we don't know what his normal rhythm is underneath this. So once we get rid of the flutter, we, we are hoping that his own natural pacemaker kicks in. And this, in his case, it doesn't make any difference because he has an artificial pacemaker in. But in patients that do not have a, a pacemaker in, we hope that their own, art, their own natural pacemaker starts acting up and kicking in and pacing because it's being suppressed by the constant atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter. So if it doesn't, we tend to wait a little bit. If it doesn't, then the patient would have to have an artificial pacemaker placed. That's a, a rare incidence. It's, a, a, it's the exception by far, not the, uh, the norm. Okay, now we're back to the 3D images. You can see again, um, Dr. Interion is, is delivering more pulses um, to some of the areas where he already delivered energy. And by looking at the, um, the electrocardiograms from his catheter, you know, he's still noting that there's still electrical energy trans, uh, traveling through the areas where he's already delivered some, some of the radio frequency ablation pulses. So that's indicating this patient, as we mentioned, um, seems to have a thickened uh, heart muscle in the area of the, the atrial flutter circuit. So he's going to go back to those areas uh, and locate, locate any, uh, any tissue in the atrium that's still conducting electrical energy and deliver more radio frequency pulses to get rid of that uh, electrical conduction in those areas. Again, looking at the, uh, the, what we call the intracardiacs and the EKG screen, um, the yellow line there is the electrical, uh, is the electrical uh, signal he gets from his ablation catheter. And before delivering the radio frequency pulses, he um, looks at that catheter to see if there's still electrical energy uh, traveling through the, the area where the catheter is. And that's how he guides where he needs to uh, deliver more radio frequency pulses. Okay, and we can go back to, uh, again, to the 3D images so you can keep an eye on how he's uh, moving the catheter. Another, another question has come through, um, maybe a good one for you. Uh, the viewer's asking, should this procedure be performed in smaller hospitals with less experienced electrophysiologists? Well, you know, it's an interesting uh, question. Uh, it's like any other procedure or any other surgery, I think. Uh, centers of excellence that do this routinely uh, can deal with with aberrant or situations or more difficult situations than uh, your smaller uh, community centers. So like any other highly specialized uh, procedure or operation, the operators that have the most experience are usually the ones that are more successful and have the least complications. Now again, you can see the, the catheter moving. He's moving the catheter further out towards the ventricle and he's moving the catheter along the line of red dots looking for areas of persistent electrical energy 
that it may be causing this this uh, arrhythmia to, to persist. Here we are back to the fluoro, so you can see how that correlates with the, the actual x-ray images in, in the heart. And the discrimination of, of point to point on the 3D mapping is within uh, two to three mi millimeters in general. So it's very precise location uh, from the 3D mapping. So you can see that he doesn't go very often to the fluoroscopy images because we know that our, our computer images are very precise. So we don't have to uh, expose ourselves or the patient to any excess of radiation for this procedure. It's a little stubborn. I think it must be one little fiber in one of these areas that it's breaking through and is mm -hmm. maintaining the circuit. Hopefully, yeah. uh, so again, we're, what Dr. Interior is doing is just searching for areas of breakthrough of electrical energy where there's, uh, where there's uh, atrial tissue that's still conducting electrical energy. The, the atrium in that area is not smooth and flat. There's often little divots or crevices or trabeculations in the atrium. And in these little depth crevices or, or um, little trabeculations, often you can get uh, atrial tissue that continues to conduct the electrical circuit. So often it's a, it's a very small part, in, uh, part of the atrium, a uh, couple millimeters or so, that actually allows this arrhythmia to persist. Now with the 3D images, we can do, um, we can use other techniques also. Right now, we're basically using it anatomically to locate where we're gonna place the burns. If this patient's arrhythmia doesn't terminate when we've um, delivered it pretty much, uh, when we delivered enough burns to get rid of the atrial tissue, what we can do is an activation map. We can electrically look at the activation and construct a, an activation map which shows us how the electrical activation of the heart proceeds over this area of the heart and, and it helps us identify the breakthrough point where this arrhythmia still uh, is persisting through. And sometimes we can see breakthrough points in, in unusual areas. Um, one of the most common, wouldn't you say, is the, is the coronary sinus? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, it, it's a structure sitting right mm -hmm. next to it. It's like a, yeah. a tube and it, in a and a lot of times a circuit just goes around it or yeah. into it and, and causes that breakthrough point. You're absolutely right. I think you, you pu didn't you publish, if I'm, if I'm not correct, if I'm not wrong, uh, a few years ago, a paper about a few it, cases. It, it, of, it, has been uh, a few, it has been a few years. It's been the uh, late 80s. Uh -huh. About breakthrough points in the right, coronary it, Exactly. Sinus. And uh, in the circuit, uh, as a septum, the, mm -hmm. um, the, the septum being part of the circuit exactly. in atrial flutter. Yeah. So still we're going we're gonna to... He's going to finish up the, the line on the, in the initial done? lines that you can see. And if there's still persistent arrhythmia after that, probably we're going to look into the coronary sinus or the, the os of the coronary sinus, the opening of the coronary sinus, to see if uh, there's electrical activation uh, transcribing through there, proceeding through there. Excuse me. Now again on the 3D image, you can see the catheter with the green tip is up towards the right hand side, upper part of the screen, and he's going closer to the coronary sinus. You can see the orange catheter there on the, on the left image, that's the catheter in the coronary sinus. So he's getting right up close to that catheter to see if, uh, if he can terminate the arrhythmia in that area.
Now, since, since we were talking a little bit about how the uh, technology is evolving, you have any uh, any uh, anything you want to let the patients know about how what we expect in the future for these procedures for the catheters, maybe? Yeah, I think in the future we are getting um, catheters that the newer energies also. Uh, radio frequency will not be our primary energy. Uh, we are now have catheters that actually freeze the area. We have catheters that will be using microwave to uh, cause lesions. Uh, those are being uh, experimentally now being used in the operating room from the outside of the heart. Um, they are high frequency ultrasound catheters. Again, the clinical trials are being used uh, in, the, in the surgical suites for uh, similar arrhythmias in patients that are having open heart surgery. Uh, so certainly yeah, better uh, catheters, different uh, technology. And you know, and I think the, the future to this is, is navigation, uh, b mapping systems. And I think you know, more and more we're, we're gonna be getting better, better systems. Yeah, you can okay. see we've gone back to the fluoro images so we can correlate again um, where we are under x-ray comparing it to our, our 3D images and you can see he's the catheter he's moved it further out by that corner. Give me a little more gain catheter. Ernie in the mapping please. Uh, what I'm telling my tech in the x-ray booth is to increase the gain a little bit so I can see the images uh, the electrical signals. In the mapping can you increase the gain a little bit? Scott, is he giving it? Huh? He's what? Okay, we have another, let's take another question here if you want. Um, there's a patient asking, uh, he's using Ticacin for the treatment of low atrial fibrillation as a, after other me medications have failed, and it's been working for two weeks after cardioversion. The question is if his arrhythmia recurs, um, would he benefit from undergoing an ablation for atrial fibrillation at this point in time, or maybe waiting a couple years down the road until the technology improves a bit further? Um, that's a, that's kind of a it's an important point. You know the the way atrial fibrillation is ablated now compared to the way it was ablated four or five years ago is much different. The techniques and the um, and the equipment we use is much different. Um, again, atrial fibrillation comes from the left side of the heart, around the pulmonary veins. Um, it's a more aggressive ablation, so the risks are a little bit higher. And the cure rate right now is um, less than many of the other types of ablation, roughly about 70%. Um, but as time progresses also with atrial fibrillation ablation, um, the cure rates are, will, uh, will more than likely uh, increase. Again, I think the, the main point for ablation of atrial fibrillation is um, the patients that really benefit from this ablation are those patients with lone atrial fibrillation. They don't have what we term structural heart disease. They don't have um, leakage of the valves. They don't have enlarged chambers of the valves. And they don't have uh, other, other um, diseases, for instance, hypertension um, and diabetes that may cause scarring in the atrium and, uh, and cause uh, atrial fibrillation that's really not lone atrial fibrillation. Okay, we can see from the uh, 3D images. Now the, the images on the screen have been rotated a little bit to give a uh, different uh, view. Um, we've gone f on the left side of the three-dimensional image from an LAO caudal looking from below and the left of the heart to more of a, uh, more of a straight LAO image. 
and the right side of the heart, the right image on the screen is, uh, is still showing us uh, uh, an AP image. But sometimes we rotate the image to get a little better look of these yeah. more difficult areas right, to... Right now I'm going to go to an RAO 30 and uh, give me a better look at it. On floor, you can see the, the catheter, the ablation catheter, um, towards the bottom of the screen and below the other catheters there. Um, right above it is that coronary sinus catheter that's going behind the, uh, behind the left atrium. It's actually projecting away from us. Okay, you can see from the, from the uh, fluoroscopy images how it, the catheter is being moved. And if we go back to the 3D images, you can see that um, he's starting another line Give me a little bit less through a different area of, of the atrium, the base of the atrium there. And he's getting rid of uh, electrical activation in this line. Um, again, as we mentioned, some of these enlarged hearts um, there can be different areas where the electrical energy is passing through and, and allowing this arrhythmia to persist. That's why I've gotten this other view, the uh, RAO view, right anterior oblique. Uh, it's abbreviated RAO, uh, to try to get a, uh, another line to, again, to throw a different monkey wrench into the uh, circuit. You can see there on the 3D images, um, the image to the left, he's starting a new line with the red dots and he's going to bring it down through the atrium and connect on the back end of the other lines with the red dots. Basically again trying to short circuit this, uh, this arrhythmia. Oh, yeah, we got a few minutes. How's he doing, Scott? Blood pressure and everything okay? Good. Saturation okay? As you can see throughout the procedure, Scott, our nurse up there, is uh, in close contact with the patient. If he's having any discomfort, we give him more sedation. Also, the oxygen levels the blood pressure is being continuously monitored. So again, a big benefit to avoid using general anesthesia in these procedures.
you can see now he's delivered uh, multiple burns on this new linear lesion that on the on the left screen there in the 3D images is going to come down and connect to the other the other lesions that he's created the other linear burns that he's created Yeah we uh, Ernie uh, go ahead we we do it one point Ernie So you gotta put the wattage back on. We had a little jump in the resistance. Mm -hmm. Put it at 35. Uh, I don't know if you wanna go back a little bit in history. I remember when I was training <laughs> and, and I trained under Dr. Interion, the initial uh, ablation equipment we used actually had uh, rechargeable batteries in them. Oh yeah, well, I, you know, I, I, yeah, yeah. Well, I remember that. Well, also, you know, it's something to be said for rechargeable batteries. You can move it around, all over the place. But boy, if, if you had a long case, battery died, you're dead. You had to have extra batteries. You're absolutely right, Peter. Yeah. You want to put some blows on? Oh, this is really a stubborn one. We. Uh, Well, I didn't want to mention anything, but I picked a tough patient for you today. So. Yeah, I figured that. <laughs> uh. Okay, if you want to go back to the 3D images, you can see the catheter now is back further in the atrium and we're almost connected that new line of red dots with one of the previous lines of red dots. Um, then again, what Dr. Interion will do is go back over that, that other line and look for any, any uh, more areas where the electrical circuit and the electrical energy is coming through. With the, with the 3D images, if the arrhythmia persists in these more difficult cases, we can actually superimpose another uh, electrical map on the heart to look for those breakthrough points. Again, the, the areas where the electrical energy is still traveling through the, the uh, heart muscle, allowing the arrhythmia to persist. So sometimes, we haven't done it so far, but uh, often we go to these activation maps when we get these stubborn cases to really look for... Uh, really look for the breakthrough point of this arrhythmia. Um, we, it, they clutter up the image a little bit, so um, you know, right now we haven't gone, gone to a, a secondary map. Again, for those of you watching, um, if you have any questions, just click on your screen and, and we'd be happy to try to answer your questions live. All right, if we go now to the uh, EKG images, and you'll see on the EKG images, the, um, the rhythm and the electrical activation in the atrium has significantly decreased. When the patient was in atrial flutter, the, uh, the rate, the atrial rate was approximately 300 beats per minute. With that last linear lesion uh, he delivered, the, ar the arrhythmia now has stopped. And the patient's being paced. Pacemaker's yeah. pacing right now. He's pacing through so the... we got it at the end. Mm -hmm. If you want to go back to the 3D image, and you'll see on that second line, the yellow dot there, that's the, uh, the successful point. And you'll see it to the right image on the screen too. That's the actual... Uh, spot where this arrhythmia was breaking through and with the burn in that area the, the arrhythmia terminated and now the patient's heart is back in normal rhythm. Well, you know this is uh, it was a uh, 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 it, it took uh, about an hour but compared to how, how long these procedures used to take. Well yeah. 
this little, little, little nerve wracking. You know, yeah. I was looking at the clock. I said, "Can I do it before that hour?" Well, if you look at it, Peter, what you mentioned is very nice. As soon as I tied the line, one line with the other, it is where it broke. Mm-hmm. You know. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, you want to paste the CS for me, please? Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Do if it. you look on the EKG screen now. The, the rate has picked up a little bit. You can see on the blue lines, that's the, uh, the electrical activation in the atrium. And through the catheter in the atrium, we're actually pacing the atrium to confirm that we've gotten rid of the uh, electrical activation that's causing this circuit. Yeah. Now by fluoroscopy, if we want to go there, uh, Dr. Interian's repositioning the, the right atrial catheter. The one that, to get a better look at that uh, atrial activation in the right atrium. So basically to simplify a little bit, what, what we're doing now is we're going to pace on both sides of that uh, the radio frequency ablation line to confirm that no electrical energy can pass through that, that area. And that's how we confirm a successful cure of the arrhythmia besides terminating the arrhythmia. Yeah, you want to keep procedure. pacing a little bit? And you can see there on the uh, on the EKG images, there's pacing. Uh, pacing is being performed from the left side of the heart through the coronary sinus catheter, and we're looking at the way the electrical activation lines up to confirm that we've gotten rid of this circuit. Getting competition with the. Uh... big for him. Right? The cap is actually too big for him. This crystal cap is big. Okay, if we want to go to the x-ray images, you can see the catheter in the left side of the image is the catheter in the atrium that he's moving. Yeah, line up block there. Yeah. Um, okay, good. You know, normally then, in this case, we won't check the normal electrical system of the heart um, because the patient already has a pacemaker, and it was determined in the past that his electrical system was not working well. Um, so in this case, we're, the procedure is pretty much over. Um, the pacemaker now is pacing his heart. The top part of his heart and the bottom part of his heart is working in synchrony. The patient's uh, cardiac output is probably going to increase by 15, 20 to 25 percent because that's the contribution that the the contraction of the atrium does to your cardiac output. Uh, Peter, uh, anything else that you want to add? Yeah, another benefit is that uh, down the road, sometimes these patients we can even take them off blood thinners because when we cure the arrhythmia the risk of developing blood clots from these arrhythmias obviously uh, decreases significantly. Excellent, excellent. Well, I think I'd like to thank everybody uh, for joining us um, from around the globe, Latin America, Europe, uh, United States. We hope that this visit into our arrhythmia center is of educational value. This is going to be one of more transmissions that we'll do in the future uh, as we, the interventional electrophysiologists, tackle other forms of cardiac arrhythmias, we will bring them to you via the web. Thank you very much for being with us. Peter, thank you for narrating. Scott, Cindy, great job. Um, Hasta la vista. Thank you and have a good evening. This has been an electrophysiological study and catheter ablation with 3D mapping performed from Mercy Hospital in Miami, Florida. OR Live makes it easy for you to learn more. Just click on the request information button on your webcast screen and open the door to informed medical care.